Welcome to this introduction to Python and programming course. My name is Alexander Hess and I will be your instructor. So over the last couple of semesters, I've been teaching courses similar to this one at the university level, in particular to students in bachelor and master programs at a business school. So in these courses, I usually don't have any prerequisites. So I don't assume you know anything about programming and Python in particular. So what is the objective of this course? The objective besides picking up a new programming language is that I want to prepare you for further studies in the field of data science. So you may wonder, why data science? Well, um, I think that one of the most common applications of coding is hap just happens to be the field of data science if you study at a business school. How is that? So in my case, for example, I'm pursuing a PhD in logistics. So in my day-to-day -day job, what I do is I work with real-life data usually big data sets, and I try to solve typical logistical problems. So for example, I try to minimize some routes uh, that um, you want to have in order to ship some product and so on. And these are typical applications. So in the field, we just um, we analyze data, uh, we run all kinds of statistics, then we, then we build optimization um, models, we build um, lots of simulations like Monte Carlo simulations and other things. And in order to do that, um, you just need to know how to code. And Python happens to be one of the languages that are very good in these topics. And even in other disciplines and at business schools, um, coding skills um, are getting more and more important um, in recent years. Okay, so that is why um, the goal, the, the actual end goal of this course is to prepare you for further studies in the field of data science. So what that means is, um, I'm not focusing on things um, that you could also do with Python. For example, web development. You know, web development, that means building a web page or building a backend for some, you know, cool, fancy mobile phone app. Um, this could also be done in Python quite well e even, and many big companies do that in Python. But, however, we are not going to focus on that. So um, that is what, uh, so when I have to choose what I put into the course and what I don't put into this course, um, that is what I have in mind. Can or does it help you become a better data scientist somehow. If so, then most likely I will put the material in, in this course. Okay, so what you are currently seeing is um, a file in the format of a so-called Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so currently this is a web browser and I'm in full screen mode. If I leave the full screen mode, you see that I'm in a, in, in a web browser. And uh, the format um, of the file that I'm currently viewing is a so-called Jupyter Notebook, formerly known as IPython Notebooks. That's the old name for them. So um, why am I using this format in this course mainly? Well, the, one of the other options I would have is to make your program, for example, in a terminal window. You know, when you watch Hollywood movies and uh, when there is um, a computer hacker in a Hollywood movie, usually what you see is a person sitting in front of, let's say, 10 big screens. And on all of them, there are these black boxes where a person can type some stuff in, some commands, and then a computer does something. And then usually they solve some, you know, cool quizzes and, and so on and some other problems. And that is a, a good way to code. And, and I do that on my day to day uh, um, basis a lot, a lot. However, that is not very beginner friendly. So um, that is one of the reasons why I choose the Jupyter Notebook format. And in a future video, you will also see the other advantages, uh, especially for beginner um, in using Jupyter Notebooks, okay? So um, how do Jupyter Notebooks work? Well, these files you can think of, they are kind of like, you know, Google Docs in the cloud. However, they are just running as we see on my local machine. And in these documents, um, they are made up of so-called cells. And here you see an example of such a cell. This is a code cell that contains actual Python code. In this case, one plus two. So if I execute this, then the computer tells me that one plus two is three. Okay, so congratulations, Python knows arithmetic. Um, but that is um, only um, a simple example. Another example of Python code um, would be a typical Hello World program that you usually learn in any programming language if you take a course. So um, what this code does here, it calls a built-in function that Python knows called print, and it gives it some text, which is Hello World. And if I execute this, what Python does is it simply prints out Hello World. Okay, so that's also trivial, but it's a, another example um, of, uh, of a code cell. Okay, 
And in the materials, what you will see is the materials that are accompanying this course, they are written in a book, so to say, that is written in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so each chapter um, is laid out in several notebook files. And uh, so you can open them and you can read through them just like in a book. And in between the text, you will see code examples and you can execute the code. You can play with the code. And um, yeah, that is the format I use. And also the exercises that um, are part of this course um, are also laid out in Jupyter Notebooks. OK, so this is um, a very good format and we will also see some other advantages soon. So let me briefly go over um, a couple of examples of organizations of companies um, that use Python in the real world, just to motivate you a little bit more of uh, why it's so cool to learn Python. So here we see um, a couple of big tech companies, but also companies like NASA. Uh, we see an investment bank like JP Morgan and so on. So what do these various companies do uh, with Python? So Google, um, what they actually do is um, they have an internal uh, rule that says Python where we can, C where we must. So C is another programming language that is a lot faster if done right uh, than Python. However, it has some other uh, disadvantages. One example is writing code and maintaining code written in C is a lot harder than uh, code written in Python. And in the business world where you have to not only write a program once, but you have to maintain it, you have to always make changes over time in a very short time frame. it pays off to use a language that is uh, good at that. And uh, many languages are not okay but python is so that is why google uses this strategy they say okay if you really need to if you really if, if you really need uh, speed in a computer then we may have to go through other uh, programming languages but if we can we take python okay that is one of their official models internally and for example the scrapers so the, um, the servers that basically go to the internet and scrape all the websites and collect the data and put them on google servers to index them um, that is actually written in python code so a, com a big company like google does that other companies like spotify facebook and also netflix they mainly use python to run data analytics and to run their machine learning, learning algorithms. So um, at the end of a song in Spotify or at the end of the movie at, on Netflix, you know that you are recommended other songs or movies to listen to or to watch. And um, many of these uh, so-called recommender systems are written in Python. So uh, that is a typical data science application, uh, also called a machine learning um, application. And also in Facebook, um, you know, when they analyze your likes and who you're friends with um, and uh, they try to make some predictions of uh, what kind of person you are, they use Python. OK, another example is Dropbox. So Dropbox is one of the companies that not only uses Python on the servers, but also on the client software. So if you on a Windows or on a Mac uh, machine download Dropbox and install it, um, you're actually running um, Python code on your machine. So Dropbox has written uh, Python code that gets deployed on machines and then their servers are also running on Python. So they have, they are using lots of Python. And uh, the um, inventor of Python, Guido van Rossum, he actually worked um, a long time ago for Google and then uh, Dropbox, um, they actually uh, so to say stole him from Google in a way and until he retired uh, one and a half years ago uh, he worked at Dropbox and uh, so uh, Dropbox is uh, very much um, connected to the Python community. JP Morgan uh, for all the people out there who want to go into uh, quantitative finance or just finance um, if you go and join their uh, onboarding program as an analyst for example you will have to do um, some introduction course in Python usually. Then here we have NASA. So why did I put NASA here? Well, um, usually these days, especially in the field of data science, people want to work with big amounts of data. And so um, when we uh, want to answer the question, like who has the most data in the world? Of course, companies like Google and Facebook and Netflix, and so on, they are among them. However, NASA is also among them. And NASA, when they collect data from telescopes, um, they're actually collecting more data than can per second than can be stored on a hard drive. So um, they are really working with big, big amounts of data. And they are also using uh, a lot of um, data, Python data science applications to, to run analysis with the data they collect. 
Okay, and then also here we have Instagram. Uh, Instagram, uh, they actually have, uh, they are running um, in their web backend, they are running uh, Python heavily. So um, whenever you communicate uh, via an app or via a web browser with Instagram, there's also a lot of Python uh, involved in the background for making the uh, web um, requests uh, work. Okay, so there are different fields of applications, but you have already heard um, from the examples that uh, companies use a lot of Python for data science applications. So I think that is a good uh, motivation for why you should continue uh, with this course and uh, study uh, Python really, really hard to become good at it. At it. Okay, now to end um, this presentation here, I want to give you three brief tips on uh, how to uh, study uh, on how to learn programming. So the first one is the most important one. It's what I call the ABC rule, which is the always be coding rule. So um, it's just that easy. Just try to do some coding each day. So um, if you uh, take um, this course and uh, in uh, one of the formats where there is at the end of the day an exam uh, at one of the universities I'm teaching that, then I don't suggest you wait until two days before the exam and start to study, okay? This is not gonna work. Um, coding and Python also as well, but uh, sh you should understand it more like a, a math exam, right? You have to study throughout the semester, you have to do exercises on a regular basis to get used to that. You have to review a lot, you won't understand a whole lot of things uh, in the first time around even when, when you try hard. Um, sometimes you just have to play with um, some stuff a bit in order to really understand how, uh, how something works. And uh, that can only be uh, learned if you work on it on a regular ba basis. And I suggest um, if you want to, let's say, uh, learn Python in the next six to eight weeks, then maybe take one hour every day um, as compared to maybe uh, five hours every Saturday or so. That's um, doing something, doing a little bit every day is a whole lot uh, better um, than anything else, okay? Another tip is um, I'm, I'm going to refer here to Paul Graham, um, who is uh, one of the co-founders of Y Combinator, the Silicon Valley based company um, that uh, invests in startups and tries to help startups become the next unicorn. Um, Paul Graham, he wrote an article that is also linked in the book um, that is uh, called the Makers Schedule. And in this uh, article, he compares two kinds of people. So on the one side, you have so-called manager type of people, and on the other kind, you have maker kind of people. And the big difference is that the manager um, has like a schedule where they work. So um, usually as a manager, um, you have uh, maybe a call at nine o'clock in the morning, then at 10, you have a meeting, and at 11, you have the next call and so on. You have deadlines, you have, um, you have to answer lots of emails uh, ad hoc, so they come in and uh, you're required to respond within two to three hours and so on. And uh, that is um, a typical manager. So it's people um, that, uh, you know, that, um, um, always have to like um, get some stimulus from the outside world and have to communicate. On the other side, uh, there are makers and uh, makers in Paul Graham's article, um, the first example he gives are for example, artists, uh, but also engineers and, um, uh, and programmers, of course. So uh, what is the difference? Well, uh, typically, um, if you talk to artists, um, they can't just uh, you know, start now to uh, paint a painting and then in an hour from now they are done or in two hours from now they are done. So usually what they do is they um, start to uh, work on a painting and then they don't like what they do so they throw it away and they take another painting and they um, try to um, come up with a similar painting but then do some things differently and at some point they like it and then maybe um, um, they uh, keep continue to work on it and at some point uh, they are done. And uh, the big difference is they need, uh, they require some, what I would call a flow state. So um, they uh, require uh, some intuition and some creativity uh, to come up. And some, sometimes you need just time for that. So we all know that when we study for an exam, and uh, tomorrow we need to really know something, then yeah, it may be good to study uh, one day, sleep over it, study uh, to review some stuff, sleep over it again. And then over time, by sleeping over it, then um, you um, yeah, slowly over time understand some concepts and uh, remember stuff. And um, yeah, so this is just uh, the way we have to view programming. Um, you will have to, you will listen to my videos, you will read through the book, 
you will understand lots of stuff i hope but then uh, when you're at the problem set then probably you won't come up with a solution right away so um, what then you should do is you just do, should do what the artist does you should uh, try to come up with some first program and see if it works and if it doesn't and then probably you will throw it away and you will come up with a second version uh, with a different approach and maybe that will work but maybe it will be the third one so um, what i'm saying is that uh, programming is uh, even for someone that is experienced it is a highly iterative process you do something uh, and then some part of it is good some part of it is not good and then you continue to work so oftentimes you know the rule that if you ask a uh, a programmer team um, you know how how much time they need to come up with some product to build an app or something they will give you some rough estimate but then a, a good project manager or um, startup uh, person uh, will always tell you okay just take whatever the estimate is times two and then maybe you have a good estimate okay so and the reason is because um, it is very hard um, to um, break down a, a software project or learning to code uh, on a time schedule basis um, it is more like uh, more like a creative process here and you have to plan for that so you have to plan that um, you don't study uh, start to study too late um, if you have to like um, um, make a deadline or study for an exam but also um, you have to um, understand that maybe you work on a problem and you make mistake after mistake and then you sleep over it and next day you wake up and all of a sudden you, you know the solution to the problem and that is very common even uh, for real life projects okay so just keep that in mind that is the maker schedule and it's an interesting article so go ahead and uh, read it and then last the t third tip that i give you is what i call faith iteration so depending on who you ask what are good tips on how to learn to code Usually, people will give you one of uh, uh, two example, uh, one of two answers. So, uh, one uh, answer could be uh, take some prototype project and just try to finish it. So, for example, if you want to go into web development, then a good prototype idea would be just uh, uh, try to come up uh, with a um, with a um, yeah website and just build it. Okay, so and that is it. But then, on the other hand. Uh, if you do if you follow this approach you learn how to finish a project and um, but you don't learn a lot of the background information and that you can only learn when you take uh, like a, a course like mine but also other courses if you read books and and so on and the important idea is that uh, these two phases the, the the phase where you just study 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 and the phase where you just build 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 none of them is better than the other they just they rather complement each other so um, that is also uh, so what i suggest is always um, study at some points but then also take one or two days where you build something uh, if you want to come up with some data science um, task then maybe just uh, take a simple data set that you can uh, get maybe from kaggle.com or from some other um, um, source and just try to make some simple analysis and just try to figure out how could you do this analysis and that that would be your prototype okay so uh, just bear that in mind you and if you only use books and only uh, watch videos you're also not gonna get very far okay you need the prototyping phase as well okay so just prepare for that um, these are three tips and the abc rule always be coding do it on a regular basis i think is the most important one Okay, and in the beginning, when you when you really learn to to code, there will be a lot of frustration involved, but after time, things will get um, a whole lot easier. Okay, so that is um, the first part um, here in the presentation. So uh, I will see you uh, in the next video.